Welcome back to Real Talk with Susan Stone and Christina Supler. We are full-time moms and attorneys bringing our student defense legal practice to life with real, candid conversations. Today, we are going to talk about the darling of our practice, and that is special education law. And I say it's the darling because even before you and I were law partners, I started the practice only dreaming about doing special ed. I still... Uh, how could there be life before us together? But there well, was. there was. <laughs> you and my three kids, well, everyone says that, but there was. And it started with special education. And one of our guests here today, who you'll introduce, Tammy, I remember reaching out to her years ago when I was just a newbie trying to break in and create a name for myself and saying, can I come talk about special education? And you were so gracious, Tammy, to host me to give a primer. And I look back then and I think, wow, what I, I wish I had the knowledge and the mileage of life experience and working with clients that I do today. But you got to start somewhere, right, Supler? That's right. So today we're going to do a little special ed work. Why don't you introduce it? Today we are joined by Tammy Sebastian, Louise Lutz, and Marbella Caceres, who are all with the Ohio Coalition for the Education of Children with Disabilities, which is a statewide nonprofit organization that serves families of infants, toddlers, children, and youth with disabilities in Ohio. And they also provide services. O-C-E-C-D. That's a mouthful. That is a mouthful. Yeah. Like all of special ed, alphabet soup, I would say, right? Yep. They work through a coalition effort with parents and other professional disability organizations. They have individual members. It's been around since 1984 to help with parent training and we are really pleased to be joined by three fabulous women today. Welcome. Hi. Thank How you. are you guys? We're doing great. We actually just finished recording a whole speech for Milestones for their conference. We did a virtual lecture, so we are just back to back today. But to start out, could one of you lovely guests explain what the Ohio Coalition for the Education of Children with Disabilities OCECD is what you do and what your given roles are within the organization. That's a mouthful, but you guys can handle it. I'm sure Marbea is going to do that, and I'm sure she's going to give you the correction on the 1984 when she, so I'll hand it over to Marbea, but 1984 is when we became a PTI. Is that correct, Marbea? Yes, that is correct. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity that you're giving the three of us to come and talk about the services. Our the most pleasure. important part, yes. As you mentioned at the beginning, the coalition has been around a long, long time, early 70s. We wow. became, yes. And then we were so lucky enough to apply for the federal funded grant to become the Parent Training Information Center for Ohio since 1984. So, yes, we have been around for over 50 years assisting families, assisting educators with anything that has to do about the responsibility that parents have under the special education process. But the most important piece is the rights that the parents have in this process and how they can become informed so they can participate in these important decision-making meetings for the benefit of their child, children. We take our job very seriously. Uh, there is not enough that I can tell you about uh, being involved at the coalition. I first became part of the coalition just to be an interpreter, translator. I've been with the coalition for over 17 years now, and I have the privilege to be serving the stay under my executive director, Dr. Lisa Hickman, as the assistant director. Right now, I'm the assistant director of the coalition. I have been for the past three years. And I also oversee the multicultural department as the statewide multicultural coordinator, assisting families that do not have English as the first language or they are limited English proficient. So That's a big role. It is. Lisa, Tammy? Yeah. So, Lisa, do you want to go ahead? Go ahead, Tammy. That's okay. Fine. So, yeah, this probably would be the even flow going to... So, I actually, and as Susan had mentioned, so I had actually previously served in Lisa's role, and then I'll hand it over to Lisa, but I had covered Cuyahoga County as an information specialist for about nine years. And what um, did you do? 
So an information specialist is very unique. So as the State Parent Training Information Center, we empower parents to become effective representatives for themselves. And there's really a lot of confusion around advocacy or advocates and information specialists. So what we do is at no cost to parents and also distincting between advocate and information specialist. As you heard, I said, we empower parents. We do not come in and speak for parents. We do not act as attorneys for parents. We do that through education, uh, technical assistance. And I'll let Lisa get into that a little bit more um, as her role now as the information specialist in Cuyahoga County. Uh, But my role now with the Ohio Coalition is I am the statewide program coordinator. And that I wear many different hats. I provide professional development to staff. I, I also create and update trainings, look for hosts and partner with different agencies to bring in statewide webinars. And also we have a, a lot of project work that we do. We collaborate with the State Department of Education, the Ohio Department of Education, and many other agencies and do a lot of project work. We're working on some cross-agency training right now with empowering families. Just We have so many things going on, and I don't want to take up all the time talking about all those things. I want to give Lisa an opportunity, and maybe we could come back around to that. And then also a big part of my role is networking and building those relationships. And that is so that parents can have a seat at the table and that they can have a voice. So Lisa? Hi, I am Lisa Lutz, and I am an information specialist and trainer. I cover not only Cuyahoga County, but Ashtabula, Lake Geauga, Portage, Trumbull, Mahoney. So it's a very wide and busy area. I do a lot of work with the parents. I do go into meetings with parents. I do primarily all virtual at this point because I can't get from one end of my area to the other. And parents seem to feel that They're treated differently when somebody comes in with them. So that support is really important to help them feel more comfortable and more heard and that their voice does have meaning. So So would you actually file a due process complaint if necessary and serve as an advocate at a hearing? I do not file due process complaints. I am not a lawyer. If a family wants to file a formal complaint with ODE, I will do some suggestions, but I don't write it for them. I can walk them through that, but that is for them to have that power to say what they want to say. And a big part of our role, too, as the State Parent Training Information Center is offering that conflict resolution, facilitation, mediation, and looking into all those things. We cannot tell a family what to do, but we want to provide them with all the options. And as you guys are aware, there's administrative review, there's the state complaint process, due process. And so we try to work through all those through training and through information. Cadre has a lot of resources. The Nas- I think that's the Center for Dispute Resolution, the National Center for Dispute Resolution. So we really try to work through the process with parents. But if that's where they land, we will certainly help and support them through the process. We just don't file on behalf, if that helps. Obviously, the work that we do, we recognize that sometimes there are systematic issues that need to be resolved for the benefit of that group of children and parents. So in those situations, we partner with agencies that do that type of work. We're very familiarized with Disability Rights Ohio, the Civil Rights Office. So we are a center also that provides resources to families. So if they come to us with specific questions, like Tammy and Lisa were saying, we guide parents, we give parents options so they can make informed decisions. That is the responsibility that we have as the Parent Training Center for Ohio. I really like that. All three of you have really, in your comments, heavily emphasized the importance of parents having a voice in the education of their children. So can you give us some more specifics on how you work with parents to empower them so that they do have voice to make sure that their child is receiving the necessary support and resources to make a meaningful benefit for their education post-injury? Yes. Yeah, well, that's great. I'm glad you guys mentioned that. 
And I, something we probably should have said, because I think we just dove right into the work, is we are all uniquely parents of children with disabilities ourselves. So number one, that is the number one thing that we bring to the table is that lived experience. And when you have that lived experience, it's much easier for parents to have that trust in knowing that you went through the process, that empathy that you went through that process. So I just wanted to come back to that and, and let you know that I am also a parent of two children with disabilities. My oldest has ADHD and my youngest has autism. And Lisa also, I, if we could probably go back around and let you know that Lisa, if you wanted to talk about your children too. Yeah, I have four kids. My oldest has ADHD and dyslexia and had to fight tooth and nail to get him the supports he needed. And all three of my boys have type one diabetes. So I have that medical piece. And Interesting. So do yeah. you deal with the interplay between Section 504 of the yes. Rehabilitation Act, the ADA and IDEA? Yes. Yes. Okay. A lot of people, that's a whole podcast on, of itself, how those things run and I, together. I do a lot of explaining the difference that Section 504 is not the ugly stepsister of the IEP. No, it's all about it access. Is, right. Yeah. So, yes, that is that is another part of our work as well. And explaining, letting them know the difference, helping them understand that and that you're not going to have a 504 and an IEP. But yeah. And you may not. You know, sometimes you want one over the other. It depends. Correct. Love that. Marbella, can you give us a yes. little personal? Yes. I'm also a parent of three children. My oldest child is 28 now, but she was identified. And that is the unique expertise that I bring because 25 years ago, I wasn't able to speak English. And I was that parent that was trying to look for assistance. But no one opened the door other than the coalition to provide me with my rights in my native Spanish language. So that is the expertise that I bring. I work with families. I have my child who, until the age of 14, was diagnosed with a specific learning disability because they thought that was just the fact that she was learning English. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. And wow. then my male child is gifted. So I have that expertise also to navigate. That is another elephant in the room with a mm -hmm. gifted education. And my little one was diagnosed when he was three with ADHD and is under the spectrum, autism spectrum disorder. So like Tammy and Lisa, the experience is very personal. So it's the unique characteristic that sometimes brings us to the level of understanding parents, what they go through and, and how I much they struggle. Yeah, and I just want to point out that parents of what we call 2E, twice exceptional kids, have their own struggles because a lot of schools, if a student is doing well and getting good grades. What's the problem? What's the problem? It's almost impossible. Oh. Those are our biggest fights with school are those 2E kids. Yeah. Yeah, we do. So we're all shaking our heads because we all are relating because if we had even a penny for every time we heard about the grades. <laughs> the uh, grades. Yes, yes the grades. but Johnny has no friends and can't sit still. Yeah, that there's no other impact but grades. And yeah, I think we've all experienced that. I could just tell you from personal experience, my daughter, unfortunately, was identified very late as gifted in her 11th grade year. What? Um, That's wow. late. Yeah. 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 Interesting. It, it was, in, it was in, I should say, let me back up. It's not. She was gifted in one area, but the psychologist was so shocked to find out that nobody thought to give her this test and this assessment and wanted to know why she wasn't in honors. And I said, they, her ADHD was so glaringly obvious that nobody could see that giftedness and they didn't test. So I think we've all experienced that at some level. But yeah, it, the grades, the, our choice exceptional children, there's so much. We could probably do this podcast once a week with you. Let's save our topics. Yeah. So for parents who suspect their child has a learning disability, what would you describe as the first steps a parent should take? What does that look like? To request a meeting with the school to, if they feel like they have a learning disability, to say that you want 
a, me- a team meeting to discuss what interventions and different supports have already been put in place, and then possibly getting a multifactored evaluation. Lisa, can I press you a little bit? Because mm-hmm. I think a lot of parents don't know that even before the IEP process and the planning meeting and the ETR, can you go through what an response to intervention is and what the tiers are? Because I think sometimes we overlook those options. We do. It's a three-tiered system similar to the PBIS program that the tier one is what everybody gets. It is the general education. The tier two is some when a student is struggling a little bit to see what other supports they might be able to put in place, whether it's math or ELA or what area that might be in, but adding additional supports, not in place of, but additional supports. And then the tier three is when you really need direct instruction, basically through an IEP. And if I could just add, I don't know if you were going to go to go any further with this, Susan, but a lot of times we see our children being stuck in that RTI process. Oh, Oh, yeah. I'm I'm well aware. Sometimes for years. And one of the things that we always bring up is that the federal law does say that they cannot use response to intervention to delay an evaluation. I mean, I think that's really important to talk about. And I always say when we're supporting parents, I always say, you know, that's great. Keep collecting your data, but let's go ahead and evaluate. Keep go, keep doing the response to intervention, but let's go ahead and evaluate. And I've and had right denials yeah. to evaluate because they're saying the response, the tier two works so well. Why do you need us to evaluate? That's well, a goodie, huh? Yeah. I, I, the, yeah. If there, the response to intervention, you're not going to have those through high school. They're not going to be doing those response to interventions on that level, as in first and second grade. And if they need that in order to be successful within that school class, in that school system, then they need to see what other support and services that they're going to need ongoing. For my, because the approach that sometimes I have for my families, many of my families are immigrant families that come here to a system that probably is a non-existent system in our countries. Okay, so try to understand how everything connects and how everything works and what the responsibilities for a school, the schools are is a very outside subjects for them, even though some of the terms that we use in special education do not exist uh, in other languages. So trying to understand that one way that I present it to my families is always that is help that the schools use for struggling learners. Somebody that is having hard time that need that direct instruction, very specific guided instruction that has a beginning that has a middle, that has an end, and also uh, that is followed with fidelity. And so those are the things that sometimes I kind of bring down to my families for them to understand how those systems connect with each other. Everything has to be in harmony for the student to have gain in their education. And it is not the academics, it's the social emotional part of the student as well. Yeah, I, and I just, I wanted to just add one more thing to the response to intervention. If a child's in response to intervention for three years, then I guess they're not responding to intervention. That's just... You think? (laughs) (laughs) Right. That's just my simplistic... Right. I I think that's well said. I'm wondering for, again, the theme of this discussion has been parents having voice and empowering them. So when, when parents are navigating this process of obtaining services for their children, what are some of the key rights that parents should keep in mind and not lose sight of? Honestly, every parent comes to us, and we talk a lot about this amongst us as staff and as parents, every parent comes to us at a different where they might be in the process. It really depends. But one of the first thing, and I know we all have different ways of working parents, but I think collectively as an organization is the first thing we do is let that parent just release everything they need to release. When they come to us, they it's there's a lot going on. We just listen. Sometimes the first phone call, we're just listening to them. 
um, maybe the first couple of phone calls. But then I think the key things that we want them to know is we really they we really have to emphasize their rights. And that is so overwhelming. That is such an overwhelming process. So we try to break it down and we do a really good job of like when we go through and we start working through the process. Now, if they're a parent that's new in the process, obviously we're going to talk about whether or not they, whether or not what, you know, what's been going on. And I think Susan had said, you know, what I, Susan and Lisa were talking about you know, initially, what do you tell the parents to do? And so we talked through that process, a lot of data collection, making sure that they're collecting data. So documentation is huge. We tell parents, that's one of the ve- the very first simplest simplistic things that they can do is make sure they have documentation and data collection because so many times parents are like we've had these conversations I've had these conversations well what was the response I don't know or they told me they were going to do this and really if we can get them anywhere just say collect that data from the beginning and then again and just, Tammy I just yeah. want to interrupt you're assuming the parents have the executive function skills to do that. Oh, great point, Susan, because I, yeah. often it's it's a big assumption that the parents are able to navigate this because this can be a very complex and overwhelming process. And a lot of disabilities are, you oftentimes will see a parent with a similar disability and they can't get organized or they don't have the luxury of getting organized. Right. I, I want to many do a children shout-out. jobs. Yep, yep, and yep. Have to juggle. Team meetings, Thanks. by the way, are in the middle of the day. It's, I know districts will try to make it early or late at the end of the day, but the executive function skills you need when you have a student with issues it can be quite overwhelming. That's right, and that's why I said we really have to meet the parent where they are at, and sometimes. It is, and I know Marbea can speak to this too, because she has a barrier with some of her families with the language. So that takes an extra layer of being able to develop certain, starting that process. Um, And Marbea, I just want to ask, does, what languages can be assisted by your organization? Obviously Spanish, but I know that we really live in a very multicultural world. What other languages can you help? Any language. Any language that is spoken, any parent, yeah. we obviously have multicultural information specialists that speak for Somali, French, Italian, Spanish, Arabic. And the ones that we don't have in the house that are working part time or full time, we contract with agencies across the state that can provide interpreter agencies. That can provide. So no family that comes uh, through our door is left with no help. And there's sometimes, many times we deal also with parents that are struggle with literacy, that cannot read or write. Parents with a special needs themselves, like you were mentioning. Like Tammy said, we meet the family where the family is. For instance, my family sometimes, oh, if you start talking to them right away about these are your rights, they're going to shut down. So we need sometimes to identify those barriers, respectfully work with them as much as possible to overcome some of the challenges because parents need to be engaged. Parents need to participate. And many limitations that they have is due to schools not doing the right thing. So it's like, okay, now you are aware that every single school district needs to have a language access plan. Now you know that. Now it's not a favor that they're doing to you by you requesting an interpreter, by you requesting this support for you to be engaged, for you to be involved, for you to be a fully participant in those meetings. You need to have this support. So the school has mandate to provide you that support. I, so once they know that, they are empowered at least to start this conversation. Yeah, I want to share a personal story. My grandparents, real, my grandmother especially, spoke initially very little English. And my mother said that when she went to kindergarten, they thought she was cognitively impaired because she really spoke Yiddish, which is really interesting because it's an almost dead language now. But they viewed her as having special needs, but really it was because she was raised and English was not the primary language of the home. So I hear you. We've done a lot of work around that, bringing in Stephen Gill 
national speaker and talking about the over-identification. So especially when it comes to language and whether or not that is, you know, the process that they need to go through, whether or not that is a true learning disability or language issue. And I just wanted to say something to come back really quick on This is, I wouldn't say a personal story, but an advocacy story that when we work with parents and meeting them where they're at, I actually, in Cuyahoga County, worked with a lot of families in underserved communities and also coming from an underserved community myself. And mom was, or grandma, I should say, I'm sorry, had full custody, was not able, very little reading, very little writing. But as we walk through the process every step of the way, even though she was not actually writing those things or she was verbally telling me what to write, how, and she, and even in the places when we started, we had to go file a complaint. And even then I did not take over for her. I had her sitting with me and she was part of the process, whether she was organizing papers, whether she was just helping to tell the story along the way, she was part of writing that complaint. And it empowered her so much that she's gone on to actually be a great collaborator with the district she's in because they held her in such high regards after she fought so hard for her grandson. So I I think it's even more important to empower those parents who might not be, who might not have those executive, who might have a disability just as their child. I think even more, and I think that we talked a little bit about that, Marve and I, about that empowering piece of just starting off with giving them where they're or meeting them where they're at, giving them what they need to get on to the next piece. That's a really nice, uplifting story, Tammy. And listening to the three of you, you're a wealth of knowledge individually and even more so collectively. And so tell our listeners a little bit about how you collaborate with other organizations and agencies to advocate the needs for uh, the needs of children with disabilities at the state and national level. Ooh, so we got a really good I one. I love it. Ooh, <laughs> don't worry. You got on. We have a Ooh, really big moment. Nice, I know, and I hope parents and professionals will be excited as well. It's no secret, but the Ohio Coalition was asked to partner with the Ohio Department of Education to look at our parent notice, which is our procedural safeguards. And our last parent notice was called a guide. And for those of you who really have been through the process of special education, they'll probably remember whose idea. And so the procedural safeguards have to have, those, so those, that's the parent notice. I mean, it has to be provided to parents and at an initial evaluation, when they request, when they provide consent, pretty much every time they turn around. And I have to tell you, and we're trying to get away from the stigma or the joking of you could probably paint your house with these because it takes away the seriousness of how important this document is. And so we got have been given the opportunity to partner with the department and rewrite uh, the parent notice. And that started a year ago, that process. And there was rule revisions from the operating standards that needed to be changed every five years, the Ohio operating standards go through a rural revision process. And we just completed that this week. We will be presenting it at the State Advisory Panel for Exceptional Children. How exciting. Yes. And then we are going to be doing a series of trainings and roll out. It's, it will roll out next year, but there's going to be a lot coming with this to educate parents. We're very excited about that. I, I couldn't think of a better way to talk about a collaboration and this is very, very important because we, we really want to model for parents that you can honestly be in disagreement with your district and you're going to have up and down and there might be conflict, but you can still partner with them and make sure that the child is always the goal. And we've done that with the State Department of Education. Um, so we hope we can model that to parents and districts alike to make sure that they're working through that process. I'm sorry I got a little long-winded. I'm very excited I about think it. we asked the right question. I'm loving the I responses. So. I'm going to conclude with a final question to all three of you lovely ladies. What can Christine and I, as attorneys in this space, what's the most important thing you'd like to see from us? Ooh, that's a good question. I like it. 
Well, I'm bringing it back to us. <laughs> it is our podcast. Oh, we're thinking hard. Yeah, <laughs> I can tell. I can tell. I think one of the things that is overwhelming for parents when they feel seek like counsel. they've got, when they seek counsel is the monetary commitments. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my families do not have that. I don't know how you structure your financial pieces, but keeping that in mind and possibly having a plan and a program to help families that do not have those resources. And that's, a, that's I, a and I agree. That is a serious issue that Christina and I talk about. Of course, we are lawyers. That's our job. We're not funded by an agency. And I think the biggest challenge we have is that we have seen attorneys immediately move to filing a new mm -hmm. process complaint because that's the only mechanism that they can think of that if they prevail, they would get attorney's fees. I'm going to be very, this is real talk. We yeah. won't do that. We won't sue just for the sake of getting our fees. In fact, I refuse to do that because you couldn't, that's it's, not ethical. And it's often not in, in the best interest of meeting and serving the needs of the child. So we just don't do that. What we I'm say so is, excited to hear that. I, so yeah. we are hourly. And we're uh, sadly, we're not a resource for someone who cannot, a family that cannot pay our fee. Because, of course, it's our job right. and that's how we get paid. On the other hand, we don't file lawsuits that don't have merit. It's a real issue. And I think that's what we try to do as a other solution is that we work with on our own staff, a parent advocate who's at a lower rate than ours. So right. we try to what we call staff responsibly. The problem we have is a lot of times people want us. Yeah. yeah. And it's I a could, real yeah. challenge. It, this is a real challenge and our hearts go out. But right. Tammy, Marbella, what are your thoughts? Well, if you don't mind, Marbella, do you mind if I, because okay, I can actually okay. piggyback off of, yeah, I can yeah. piggyback off of that. I, it was interesting because you had said at the beginning that we you know, did a, had a training years ago, and it ties into what you're saying. You're not filing for the you know, for the sake of filing. It's whether it's in the best interest of the family. I, that would go to say that you would love to be proactive in the process, and and, you know, and I think actually having us here today speaks volumes to that. It, me as the person who needs to bring in statewide presenters, I think I would love to bring you guys in to do some statewide webinars and maybe collaborate on some training. So that would be me. our That's way of wonderful. giving people. Yeah. yeah. We'd love to train people to advocate. It's Thank a, it's you. a hey, Thanks, Tammy. For sure. Yeah. This was incredible. Ladies, do you have any final parting words that you would want to share? And we'll send you this podcast so you can share it around because I think we've touched on a lot of important issues. We have. Marbella, did you want to go since you were? I, I just want to tell parents, it's dirty sitting to this, that every day is a day of an opportunity to know a little bit more of what you know, what you knew the day before. Because sometimes as parents, we feel guilty of not knowing what is the right thing to do for our children. I always tell my, my families, you know your child better. And we always repeat that anybody here, you have the best interest in the child. and Go by your gut instincts. As mothers, we're very unique situated. God give us an extra six cents to follow that direction. So I just want to encourage parents, uh, if they have questions, anything that we can do as an agency for them, we are here to support you and empower you every way possible. And I would just say the same thing. I would just just go a little bit deeper and say that if you think, like Marvea said, she said, if you have that gut instinct to go on it, it never hurts to get the information. And sometimes it's just coming to get some information and empowering yourself, opening yourselves up to that. And I also want to put, if you don't mind, our intake number out there. So please, that way, please. Sure. yeah, so it's one 382 Five four five two, and uh, you will be connected with Martha Laze. She is our intake referral specialist, and so anywhere in Ohio you're at, she'll be able you to direct you. Like Marbella said, we cover the entire state of Ohio, 
There's not a language out there. We don't turn anybody away, That a language out there that we don't serve. And again, just thank you guys for giving us the opportunity to reach parents because that's always, that's always the challenge is we get parents that come to us and say, I wish I would have known about you guys. And it's so hard for us to hear. So this helps us with our outreach. And I'll hand it over to Lisa. And this is our podcast is our way of really talking about the issues that need to be talked about, opening up the idea of resources, opening up minds. And so for those parents who need free or and affordable resources, we are so grateful to the coalition. Lisa, what are your thoughts? I just want to thank you for having us and tell parents that we're here. We're, we're here for you and we're here for your child. We want the best for them and we will help you learn to be their best advocate. And again, we with Christina and I would love to come in and train people to be self-advocates. So thank you for that idea. This was a real treat. Thank you for taking time out to speak with us today. Thanks for listening to Real Talk with Susan and Christina. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our show so you never miss an episode. And leave us a review so other people can find the content we share here. You can follow us on Instagram. Just search our handle at Stone Supler. And for more resources, visit us online at studentdefense.kjk.com. Thank you so much for being a part of our Real Talk community. We'll see you next time.